chapter 9, starting at verse 9. When you're there, say amen. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9 says, Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. Let's pray. God, you speak. God, you move. God, you be. Do whatever you want to do, Father God. I just pray, Father God, that you just anoint me, God, that you would be with me tonight, God, as I say, God, what you have given me. And I pray, Lord, that it blesses your people, that it encourages us, God, that it makes us, God, just more empowered for the nights and the days to come, God. And, Lord, through all of this, we pray, God, that you get all the glory and honor and the praise. We love you. And we thank you, God. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. The title of the message tonight is The Fear of the Lord is the Beginning of Wisdom. A couple weeks ago, I woke up out of my sleep, and it was like five something in the morning. And it was still pitch black outside, and I was like, why am I up? I still have an hour to sleep before I have to go to work. So um, if you're like me, you like to wait till the last possible second that you have to get up. But um, so I get up, and usually when I'm woken up by my sleep, I know it's the Lord. And I'm up, and I'm looking outside. It's pitch black outside. It's pitch black in my room. I set my TV's on. My door is closed. I'm like, all right, God, turn off my TV. I go to sleep. So I start laying in my bed. It's pitch black, and I see my phone just flashing. I'm like, what? Who was texting me this early in the morning? So I get a text from someone, and I read it just half asleep, basically. And um, she sent me these two long text messages, but um, part of the first one, she said she had a dream that a bunch of people were praying over me, and I fell to my knees. And the Lord said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And he said it over me five times. And um, I was kind of like, hmm, it's very interesting. So I didn't say anything back. I just lay back in my bed, and I just kept thinking, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. I'm laying there, and, I, and I, now I can't sleep. And I'm looking, and my eyes are open, and it's pitch black. And the only thing that's in my head is the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And I'm like, really, God? <laughs> so I'm just like, man, I'm just up. So I'm just laying there. And all of a sudden, I see my... My door just creaking open, creak, and I'm like, really, God, really? And my door goes all the way open, and I kind of popped my head up, and it was my dog, Duchess. I was like, really, God? But as I was uh, thinking about all that, the Lord brought me to the scripture. In Proverbs 19.23, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction, he will not be visited with evil. You cannot confuse the spirit of fear with the with the fear of the Lord. And I feel like now people are all, they're always bringing up, you know, I thought we weren't supposed to have fear. I thought perfect love casts out fear, in which it does. But there is a big difference between being scared of the Lord and fearing the Lord. When you're scared of the Lord, you have something to hide. Think about Adam and Eve. When they disobeyed God, they were trying to hide because they knew. They were scared at that point. But when you fear the Lord, you are literally terrified to be away from God. You have respect for him. You reverence him. You stand in awe of him. And you want to be wherever he's at at all times. Jesus said, as he was in the world, so are we going to be. So everything that the Lord possesses is crucial for us to have as children of God. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, starting at verse 1. 
There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says the, that wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and all you're getting, get understanding. Okay, so I'm talking a lot about wisdom and fear. So what am I trying to say? As the church, we lack wisdom because we lack the fear of God. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. Because when you truly fear God, we're going to let go of our insecurities because we're putting everything into him. There's not going to be any competition with anything or anyone because we have one goal, and that is to build the kingdom of God together. We are no longer trying to make a name for ourselves, but we make the name of Jesus famous. We del his delight should be our delight. We love what he loves. We hate what he hates. Proverbs 8, 13 says, the evil pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate I was listening to uh, John Bevere today and he was talking about Jim Bay and uh, he was talking about this encounter he had with him when Jim was in prison those of you who know him he was an evangelist who got caught with adultery and fraud and some other stuff um, but his secretary Got, got a hold of John Bevere and was like, Jim wants to see you. He wants you to come visit him. So he goes and he visits him and they're talking and they're having this conversation. And, and John Bevere says to him, he said, when was it that you began to fall out of love with Christ? He's like, I never fell out of love with Christ. And John's like, what are you talking about? You committed adultery. You you." committed fraud. You did all these things. He's like, I, I never fell out of love with Christ. I just stopped fearing the Lord. And when I heard that, oh my, that shook me like to the core. There are millions of people who love God, but don't fear him. Every, you know, even, even men and women in the Bible, they had their moments. You think about Peter, you know, the time that he denied Christ at that moment, he feared man more than Lord. But the one that I really want to talk about tonight is Samson. I honestly feel like this that his story is one of the most tragic stories in the whole Bible. But there's some things, you know, me and my brother were talking about him. There's some things that I started really studying and digging into that I'd never seen before. So I'm going to start with the obvious, with the story that we've heard all the time in church. And like I said, it's going to be it's going to be a lengthy read. But God wants us to see something out of this. So if you have your Bible, turn to Judges chapter 16, and we're going to start at verse 4. So pay close attention. Sometime later, and I'm reading from the NIV, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistine went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we might tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued, which, first of all, she needed to be rid of right at that second. But she said, Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. 
So Delilah took some new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to them, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids on my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids to his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you? Here she goes again. When you won't confide in me. This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his, head, of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. But what is so crazy about this story is that Samson letting this woman know his secret, leading him to get his hair cut, wasn't the beginning of his disobedience to God. He was being completely disobedient even before this happened. Samson was a Nazarite, which meant he was separate from the rest, which meant he wasn't supposed to drink wine or the fruit of the wine or be around it. He also wasn't supposed to go near or touch a dead human or dead animal. So look at Let's go to Judges chapter 14, starting at verse 5. And we're going back now. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he neither told his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Sometime later, he went back to marry her. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that, they had, that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. So we see, let's just recap what we just read. So we see the moment Samson gets close to a vineyard, which is a place that he's not supposed to be around, there's a lion. So he kills a lion, and then he comes back to the lion's dead body, and he eats honey from it and also gives it to his parents, who had no idea where he got it from. And Samson knew good and well he wasn't supposed to do what he did, and that's why he didn't tell his parents. But the Lord knew. The Spirit of the Lord even came upon him, and Samson still did something that he knew he shouldn't. So even after him doing what he did, the Spirit of the Lord still came upon him. So think about that. I believe that this is a moment he started to lack the fear of God and started to just fill himself just a little bit too much. Then we see another account, and this is once again before Delilah was on the scene, of Samson once again being disobedient. So let's go to Judges chapter 15, starting at verse 15. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, with the donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With the donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath Lahi. I think I'm saying that right. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? 
Then God opened up the hollow place in Lahi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So see, here, Samson was again touching something he knew that he shouldn't. And then he made this big old speech about how he killed a thousand men with something that he shouldn't be touching. But still, the Lord gives him and quenches his thirst, despite his disobedience. So let's keep reading. You guys are going to get something out of this, I promise you. If I can get something out of this. Okay, here we go. So last we see, Samson, he comes. After that happened, now he's coming into the Valley of Sarek. This is where he, he falls for Delilah. And I was studying the etymology of Sarek, and it's called special vine, which actually refers to grapes and wine in the area. So this place... This is a place that I believe that Samson lost the fear of the God, fear of God, causing him to completely lose his wisdom. Because if you think about the story, you, he has to be completely out of his mind to not see what's going on here. So I believe that this is a place where he just lacked all of his wisdom. So I'm going to go ahead and read it again about what happened with him in Delilah. So just pay close attention. Back to Judges chapter 16, starting at verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been tied, I'll become as weak as any other man. I know we just read this, but just keep following along. There's a point to this. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I will become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hitting in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids in my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with the pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric and tightened it with the pen. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick of it, sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head was shaven, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. I believe that Samson really thought that it didn't matter if he told Delilah his secret. It didn't matter if they come there because the Lord was still going to be with him. The Lord was with him when he killed the lion and ate from its dead body. The Lord was still with him when he killed a thousand men using the jawbone of a donkey. The Lord was still with him when he decided to live in a place that was known for the fruit of the vine. This time the Lord had left him. 
The Philistines made Samson their slave, took out both of his eyes, and basically made him for their entertainment. In that moment, I think Samson really started to get it. Let's read in Judges chapter 16, starting at 25. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can fill the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. On the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more, just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines from my two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. So many times, and that, that story is just so tragic to me, but so many times we enter into the house of God just so casual. I mean, read is a word so casual. And we enter into worship so casual. And we enter into his presence so casual with of the Lord at all. And when all God wants to do is just bless us. And trust us with blessings if we fear him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and wisdom will rebuke us if we fail to obtain it. Proverbs chapter 1, starting at verse 20, says, Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple live your simple ways? Love your simple ways. How long will, you, will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hands, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps you over like a whirlwind, when distress and, re- and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will not eat the fruit of their ways. They will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For by the waywardness of the simple, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear and harm. And when we begin to obtain wisdom, we're gonna see fruit and we're gonna see life. Proverbs chapter two, verse six says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of the wicked men, for men whose words are perverse. When I was getting this message together, I had no idea, I had no idea where to go with it, but I knew, like, and even today I was like, God, do you want me to talk about this? I feel like there's been a lot of just, like, rebuke lately, um, and I was just like, Lord, just give me confirmation about what you want me to and then he said wisdom, <laughs> so I said, okay, but I started examining my own life. And I started thinking about all the things that I take casual. And I started thinking about just the things that we go through. 
the things that we go through and how sometimes, especially if we go through thing after thing after thing, you start to grow numb. And it's, and then you start to go numb to the things that God says, which for me, that's a scary place to be at. And it's just like the word, we start reading the word, it's like, okay, I've heard that before. You know what I mean? We start listening to sermons like, okay, I've heard this last year. People come and they speak over us and like, I've, I've heard this for years. And it's like, we don't take God for what he says. And it's crazy because I've been like at this place where like things happen and you begin to, to get numb at it, not so much the word of God, but just like things that happen outside of your control. And I'm like, Lord, show me what that is. Is it just like an immeasurable amount of peace or is it just like my flesh is just like, because, you know, if you're, if you're constantly being shot at, eventually you're just going to be like, all right, I just got shot at again. You know what I mean? Instead of just, like, feeling the pain of how that hurts, you know? And so I started thinking about the fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord. And I was like, God, you know what? The more that I think about it, the more I don't really know if I understand it, <laughs> the fear of the Lord. And then when I, I started listening to what John be very sad about, you know, him being in the prison with Jim Baker. And I realized how easy it is to be a Christian and say, I love God, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, but I have no fear for the Lord. And just where it took him. I started studying more about Jim Baker and just all the stuff that he contributed to and all the things that he did outside of the craziness and just where he ended up, you know? And he ended up saying, um, as John was talking to him, he said, actually, like being in this place, the Lord showed me mercy. Because he was actually supposed to be in there for, I think it was 45 years, but I think he was there for eight. And uh, he said, the Lord showed me mercy. He's like, if I wasn't here, I don't know where I would be. And I just started thinking about God. <laughs> and I just started thinking about just who God is, who God is to me, who God is to you, who God is to the church. And the thing that kept coming in my mind is we still haven't got it. <laughs> we still haven't had that light bulb come on you know what I mean this is God not just us saying it but in our hearts in our spirit this is God so when things happen but this is God this is who I serve this is who I am and I feel like I don't want to lack in any more areas and I was just talking to Vez before the service and I was saying to myself I was thinking, I'm like, God, you know, I've given my life to you. And then I had to take it back. So I'm like, no, I haven't, because there's still parts of me that have to die. And I'm just like, Lord, I don't want to lack in anything. I don't want to lack in anything. And the thing about the whole, you know, all these good things that God has to say about you, the stand, is that even when you feel like you're a mess, even when you feel like you're not, you just suck at everything, God comes up to you and he's like, you've been so faithful. And you're like, what? I mean, let's be even talking about this. You, you could have just committed the worst of the worst sins of everything. And then God comes up and he's like, you know, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to preach to the nations. And you're just like, do you know what I just did yesterday? And so I start thinking about all this stuff. I'm like, God. I don't know you like I thought I did. <laughs> There's so much more to you that I don't know. And I don't like not knowing it. <laughs> but it's there for us. It's there for us. But the thing is, that wisdom, it comes when we fear the Lord. And what I never really got in my spirit is the fear of the Lord is I don't want anything to come between me and you. Like, I am scared to death to lose you. 
That's where the fear of the Lord comes out. That's, that's the difference between David and Saul. Where he was just like, Lord, when he did what he did, he was like, Lord, please don't let your presence go for me. Please. That's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm terrified of. Even though all these people are saying all these things about me. You, you read in Psalms how he talks about all these people are after him, accusing him, abusing him. But he's like, Lord, more than anything, don't let your presence leave for me. That's what I'm most terrified about. And I'm just like, Lord, what, what am I terrified to lose? Is it these earthly things? Is it, is it my desires? Or is it that? Is it this? Or is it you? Because when it comes down to it, it's all about Jesus Christ. And I know he makes it about us. And that's, it's kind of, it's, it's weird. It's, we don't know how to explain it. It's all about him, but it's all about us, but it's all about him. We don't know how to explain that. I'm not going to. It's okay. But just, Lord, how can I fear you more? How can I fear you more? I look at the world, and there's so much of the spirit of fear over the world, and even part of the church. There's that spirit of fear, and there's this thing where, like, even when people come to the church, they don't want to be a part of the body because they're scared. They think God is, like, coming down with a hammer ready to just go down on them. But he just wants to embrace them. And part of that is the church because there's been these people who are just like legalistic, you know, just pounding people and saying, oh, I don't want to be around them because of this or that. Or did you see what they did? But it's like, no, God wants to embrace, embrace us. And I, I, I want to be able to, one thing I always pray before I read the word, I said, Lord, give me wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. And I'm, I'm always praying that, like, okay, opening up my Bible, give me wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment. But then God says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And maybe that's why sometimes we read this word, we don't know what in the world is saying. Because we're just reading it like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Got my little chapter done, I'm out. You know? So when I was watching that sermon, or it wasn't really a sermon, but it was just John Bevere, he was talking. He said a prayer over just everyone that was watching, just praying just for, it was just so crazy, the words that were coming out of his mouth. He's like, I just pray the fear of the Lord on people. And it almost sounds crazy when you say it like that. But I was sitting there, and I just, like, raised my hands. I'm like, Lord, I just receive it. And I just felt like the Lord just pounding on me, like, in a loving way. And I was just like, Lord, I know we're going to get it right. But we have to be able to recognize what's going on. And this is one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the fear of the Lord. Because people want to take it as this bad thing. But it's not. And even John Bevere, he was talking about how he went to a church uh, and this was, like, in 1994, he went to the ch this church. This was during, like, the charismatic movement where G people were, I don't know if it's, like, what me and Beth were talking about, people looking at Jesus like he's a hippie or something. <laughs> like, peace and love and drugs and yes, but no. Um, but he he went to this church, and he, during this movement where people were just, like, it's all about what God can do for us. He, he preached the fear of the Lord. And he said that he came back the next day, and when the pastor came up to introduce him, he grabbed the mic and he said, basically just like came against everything that he had said the day before. He was like, we're the New Testament church, and perfect love casts out all fear. So he was basically going against everything that John Bevere said. And then after he got done, he was like, all right, guys, welcome John Bevere. And so he said he walked up there just like, you know, just feel him just defeated. And um, he said the church didn't accept him. And he was walking out with his wife. And the, pa the other pastor's wife came up to his wife and said, come back anytime." And didn't say anything to John. And he said he drove to a construction site. And he was sitting there. And he just cried out. He was like, God, I'm so sorry. I hurt the church. And he said the Lord didn't bring him any type of correction. He said what you said was right. 
what you said was right. And he's like, you will see. And he said now, because this, I guess this church was this huge international church, um, and now they're just non-existent. That's how important the fear of the Lord is, people. It's important for us to get a hold of this. I wish I can preach it the way that I feel it, but it's just kind of impossible right now. But what I just want to do tonight, like I said, we're going to keep coming together until the Lord just releases me from that. But I just want to pray for the fear of the Lord to come over you. Because when it does, when you finally get a hold of it, and, it's, and, it's, and you have to be very, very careful with it because that is why a lot of these pastors have gone the way they've gone. They started out with the fear of the Lord. God gave them all this authority. They're doing all this stuff. Then they got a little bit big, a little bit too big of a big head. Start doing all this other crazy stuff. And then it's some sort of scandal. Because at some point they lost the fear of the Lord. It was like, oh, I'm doing all these great things. God's giving me the strength. Now it's their strength. And then they're forgetting about, oh, I'm terrified to be away from the Lord. Because when... When you are terrified of being away from the Lord, you're going to hate what he hates, and you're going to love what he loves, and you're going to hate evil, and you're going to hate sin. But when you get to this place where you start doing all this stuff, you start losing the fear of God, and you end up in the pit somewhere. And so I never want us to get to that point where we're like, because greatness, and this, it, greatness is coming to the people of God. Blessings are coming to the people of God, and that's Okay. It's okay to embrace the gifts and, and everything that the Lord has for you and wants for you. But when you get to that point where you forget about who you are in Christ and what Christ has done for you and about the most important thing, which is this, then that's what you need to be afraid of. So tonight I just want us to, to pray just to fear the Lord on all of us because we need it. To get to that point where, like, I'm reading this word because I want so much of God that even if I have to read the same scriptures over and over again, I'm going to read it till I get it. I'm not just going to skim through and then close the book and have no idea what I just read. Get to the point where when you come into church, you're just ready. You're like, okay, God, what you have for me? Okay, God, what can I give, to, give for you? What can I do for you? What kind of song can I sing? What kind of dance can I dance? How can I give myself to you? It's not just casual. Here we are again. No, it's Lord every single time. Thank you, Lord. I get to be in your presence again. I get to be in your presence again. I get to come into the house of God. I get to uh, be corrected if I need to. I get to be encouraged by the word. I get to pay attention and hear and understand and, and embrace things I've never heard before. I get to have greater uh, wisdom and knowledge and discernment and understanding. And not take it so casual, not take it so just whatever. Not just, oh, I've heard this before. If you've heard it before, there's a reason why you need to hear it again. To come in here and just like, even if, you know, sometimes with worship, it's hard to and could get in. Like, if you don't know the song, you're like, what is this song? Or if it's not a song that you like, you're like, you know, I can't. But it's just like, it's not about that. It's just, God. I, I want to be close to you no matter what. Not, no matter if they're playing country gospel. I'm going to worship you because I'm afraid to be anywhere that you're not. And I feel like that is what the church has lacked. It's just like we're going to do whatever we want. We're going to keep silent when we know that we should be raising our voice up to some things. We're going to, be, we're going to keep silent when... Um, so the big stuff start happening. And I'm going to say something about this whole Starbucks cup thing that's going on. Here's what I have to say about that. There's the Starbucks cup. They changed their design. And a lot of the Christians were upset about it because it didn't have, like, the whole Merry Christmas theme, theme on it. Which, okay, I understand. But this is, I ha there's two things to that. A lot of people were saying, why are Christians mad about this? There's, there's people that need adoption. There, there's people that are homeless. But the thing is, the same people that are saying those things are not doing anything. So what are you doing while you're attacking the people talking about the cup? What are, are you feeding the homeless? Did you adopt somebody today? Did you lead somebody to Christ? Now all the Christians want to start talking about a cup because everybody's talking about it. But what have you done? 
What have you done to stay close to the Lord? What have you done to give the Lord pleasure? That's my whole take on it. If you want to say something about something a Christian is saying, and you're like, well, you should be doing this, you need to make sure you're doing it. You need to make sure you're doing it. So that's just my whole thing with that. But tonight, I just really feel like I, I feel like God has shown so much grace, so much mercy, just with the, 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 the story of Samson. But I don't want us to end up some tragic story where our last hurrah ends up, ends up with us being dead. You know what I mean? With us just losing everything and pleading, God, just one more chance. No, I just want, I want to get it right now. I want to get all God has for me right now. I want to help encourage and bless the church right now. I want to move past how I feel, what I see, what's going around me right now. And I just want more of God. I just want more of God. I, I feel, I keep talking about this, but I, I really feel that God is showing us a part of him that we've never experienced. And when you have something that you've never experienced, you it's hard to be intimate with something you're not familiar with. And so God is trying to teach us these new things. God is trying to teach us this new side of him because we haven't seen it all, guys. I don't care how long you've been serving God. You haven't seen it all. You haven't felt it all. You haven't experienced it all. There's so much more. There's so much more to God. He just wants to express that. And he wants us to embrace that. And he wants us to get to that point where I need to get to you no matter what. No matter what's going around me. And that's the fear of the Lord. That's what gives us wisdom. That's what gives us knowledge. That's what brings us understanding. It's like, no matter what, God, I'm going after you. And it's so easy to just sit back. It's so easy just to sit back. And sometimes, you know, you just want to be like, wait, God, hold on this one second. Let me just sit down for this one second. God's like, no, we don't have time to sit down. If you want to, if you want to jump on that band, bandwagon with everyone else, go ahead and do it. But if you want to do something amazing, be prepared to suffer. Be prepared to do all these different things. But I'm going to be with you. You know, Pastor Steve was talking about that shift. And when he said, I, there's a shift came, coming, and I hope we don't miss it. It's almost just like this train, you know? This train is about to take off. And I can just see so many people running after it. Like, you know, they, they missed out. But I want to be on that train. I want to be first in line before it even starts going. Because I feel like the conductor is getting ready to be like, it's time, guys. It's time to go. It's time to go to that higher place. But in order to get to that higher place, we're going to need to have the fear of the Lord. We're going to need more than ever. We're going to need wisdom in these last days. We're going to need knowledge because some of us can't discern God from Satan. And so we need to be on this. This needs to be, like, stirring in us right now. This needs to, like, mean something to us. So if you guys want to stand with me, if we just want to come, we're just going to have, we're going to call it circle time. Okay, all night the Lord's been dealing with me, and he, what he keeps saying is, is what we're doing in our lives causing us to be effective for the kingdom?